So, um, yeah, I'd like to introduce today Georges Menezes, who uh, is a new, relatively new uh, postdoc in Earth System Science uh, since October this year, working in the area of movement ecology. Um, Georges did his uh, bachelor's and master's uh, in Brazil. He's Brazilian. Uh, uh, the former at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and the latter at the Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul. Um, then he went to Ben Gurion University uh, in Israel to do his PhD. Back to Brazil after that for two postdocs, um, one at the University in Mato Grosso de Sul and the other at the National Center for Predators at the Brazilian Ministry of the Environment. Both of those um, were supervised by people that I pretty regularly collaborate with uh, in movement ecology, um, one of whom I, I know quite well, uh, Ronaldo Morado. Uh, we work together quite a bit and uh, he comes George comes highly, high, very highly recommended from both of them. So that was a, that was a nice, uh, nice bit of connection there. Um, and then after that, uh, he went back to uh, Ben Gurion again in Israel and was was postdocing there again uh, up until the point he he came to us. So he will tell you all about what he does. Um, and so I, I will uh, hand the mic over to him and let him let him do that. So thank you, George. All right. Well, thank, thank you uh, for inviting me and for, for everybody for listening. And so I guess the way that I would like to start presenting my work is also to put it to, into a more scientific context, which is trying to answer this question of how foraging ecologists is going to react to this new age of big data that we're having uh, at the moment in, in the uh, recent years. So I think the best way to, to start that is since we are in a sort of a interdisciplinary institute, I think it makes sense to start by introducing what is foraging ecology and give you guys uh, some notions in some of the big theorems and revolutions that we had in this little discipline of ecology. And then I can hopefully I can do some examples of my own research. And then introduce an issue that we have in that area, which is the problem of lack of generality in our uh, current theories, and how some new avenues of research and how some connections with different areas of ecology can kind of help with this issue. More specifically, species distribution modeling, which is a relatively new area in ecology, and movement ecology, which also has received a boom of data in the last uh, years. And hopefully that will also make a nice hook on how it connects with my work here with Justin and uh, with his uh, group of movement ecology. So to begin with, um, I think it's important to define even what is foraging. So in case nobody has ever came across with this word before, foraging is just searching for wild food sources, right? Uh, it's not something exclusive of ecology, right? It's a term that is used also in sociology or in, you know, in day-to-day -day use of the words and is often associated with the idea of hunter-gatherers looking around in the, in the wild for food or for fish or any form of uh, finding food, but is also associated more recently with this hobby of you know, collecting mushrooms when you get to autumn in certain countries, I believe there are certain countries here in Europe that is quite popular, right? And on a more unfortunate side, foraging is also, and the theories associated with it are also used to understand the behavior of beggars because it's also a form of hunting, if you think about it, like a hunting for food. And if you want a more relatable example, is also something that uh, graduate students do a lot when you are in a university that has a lot of conferences and optimize your routes between them to get, you know, free buffets. So we have this side of uh, foraging, but of course we are more interested in foraging ecology, which is trying to understand uh, how the act of searching for food by a specific animal can influence its prey, of course, like nobody wants to be hunted, but also its predators and other species that are around in the natural community. So 
it's considered a sub branch of behavioral ecology. And because of that, we're going to be much more focused on how the effect of the animals searching for the food can influence the environment and a little bit less on the more, let's say, demographic and populational effect of, you know, when a jaguar hunts are toy toys, there is now one less tortoise that has propagating effects. Instead of that, we're going to focus more on the hunts or the searching for the food. So, of course, I guess the best way to do that is to start where the science has started. And for a long time, that basically meant figuring out what animals are eating, right? You can do that by observation, but I must admit the most uh, efficient and common methods to be used are the most uh, brutal ones in which you just figure out what's inside of the stomach of the animal and then you can you know, kill the animal, do a stomach wash or in the cases in which the animal is more delicate, you can also examine his feces and figure out what he ate based on the remnants there. And once you do that, you essentially end up with a list that has, uh, you know, the species that have been eaten and their proportion. And then you can do a ton of nice comparisons, like, uh, you know, how the diet of this animal changes in a specific, depending on the location, depending on the species, depending on the season, and all sorts of media uh, uh, comparisons. But I believe, at least in my opinion, it starts to get interesting when people start developing theory and developing some ability to predict when animals, uh, what animals will eat and when they will eat. So that basically started, as far as I'm aware, with the optimal foraging theory, which was um, introduced mostly by MacArthur and Pianca in that paper in 66, but to kind of shorten out the presentation and also uh, move on already to one of the most impactful papers. I want to jump in and start explaining from Charnov's marginal value theorem paper, right? Uh, also because the way he assembled the theory from a mathematical point of view is still being used today, so it makes sense to, to start with him. And the most important idea of those two papers is a, a very simplifying notion about how the animals think. And we are simply assuming that animals uh, maximize energy over time. Their entire interest in their life is just to get more energy per hours that they have on their life. And the reason to assume that is the very simple idea that, you know, if you have an animal that has more energy, he's probably a better competitor. He's probably can find mates more easily. He probably can do everything in his life easier, right? And hence, he's going to have more babies and hence, he's going to pass his genes for the next generation. So he'll have a greater fitness, or ecological fitness. So with that single goal in mind, we can also further assume that the animals are walking randomly through space or in a straight line, whatever is more convenient for you. And once in a while, we will come across food patches, right? Which are basically just areas of the landscape that have more food than others. And of course, there are patches of different quality. Some have more food, some have less food. But what every patch has is a function that describes how much energy you're going to get based on how much time you invest in that patch, right? And this function can have a myriad of different shapes, right? This is from uh, the figure here is on the right is a bunch of examples that Charnock gave in one of his books, right? But to the one that I like to focus the most in the way is the easier to remember. But the most important thing is that these functions have diminishing returns, meaning that you're always gonna get more energy if you invest more time, but if you're investing large amounts of time, you, this relationship is gonna slow down, right? So, Armed with those assumptions, we can try to figure out or calculate how the energy over time of the animals should uh, change in the environment. And we can basically assume that, you know, the energy is just going to be a sum of uh, the energy that the animals get in each patch, which here is represented by this growth function that I mentioned before, right? Multiplied by the probability that you find one of those types of patches, right? And you have a much similar uh, rationale for the time. It's just that instead of energy, we are using the pure time. We just have two extra terms here, which is the amount of energy spent 
while searching, while being between patches, right? And you have also uh, uh, the same amount of time being wasted between patches. So with this simplifying idea of how to measure energy over time, you can assume what is the best behavior that the animal can do, what is the behavior that is going to give him the maximum amount of energy, right? So the way to do so is just the, the very simple trick of uh, mathematics of taking the derivative of the function and setting it to equal, and that's going to give you unnecessary condition for the maximum or for the minimum. And if you do that, you're going to get this very weird self-referential formula here. Oops. Well, it's still this formula here, so I'm not going to change. So in essence, we have that the amount of the derivative of the energy that you're getting per time on a particular patch must be equal to the total energy over time. So the way that Chernov interpreted this formula, the, the way he made it make biological sense was to think first that the left side is always something that is decreasing, right? Because we have diminishing returns, you are always going to start foraging on the patch and receive a lot of energy. And as time goes on, you receive less and less of energy. So this rate is decreasing. So the only way that you will match a constant, right, is if it's slowly, if it starts high and then slowly, 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 get to the level in which he matched that constant. And then this condition is realized. So he thought that this condition must be the stopping condition for the animal to forage. Right, so when this condition becomes true, that's the moment that the animal leaves the patch. And the, on the left, we have basically then the harvest rate, the energy that you're getting on the patch. And on the right-hand side, we, we have the total energy per time, but this formula also represents an average. If you look at its shape, right, it's basically an average across the different patches. So finally, to turn that into a biological statement, we can say that the optimal forager he should stay on a patch until this patch is given more energy than the average of the environment, right? So it took a while to get there, but it's a very concise statement, very testable statement. And as soon as people learned of that, they also realized that this sounds very economical, right? Like, you know, the value of something is greater than the value of the average. So people immediately realized that there is a very clear connection here with the with microeconomics, right? And the biggest connection is the fact that this idea that the average of the environment or the benefit of doing something else, right, reduces the amount of time that you do your chosen activity, right? is known in microeconomics as the missing opportunity cost. So it's just this idea that you are always making a relative comparison between what you're doing right now and what you could have been doing. And if we have this idea that, you know, the, the benefit that you get from the patch must be equal to its costs, it makes sense that we are going to have other costs beyond missing opportunity costs. One of them is, of course, the metabolic cost. If we imagine that you take 500 calories per hour to keep your body alive, and this patch of food only gives you 300, even if it's the best patch in the universe, it doesn't have a lot of sense for you to be there because you're not making enough energy to sustain yourself. So this is a very easy uh, cost to add, but the coolest cost that people thought about is to add predation risk as a cost. Because if you think about when you are preyed upon when you are killed, your energy over time goes to zero, right? So we can think of predation risk or your probability of dying as basically a cost, a caloric cost. Like if you have a hundred percent chance of dying when you enter that patch, uh, this patch has a cost equivalent to your current energy over time. If you have 50% chance, you have 50% of that cost. So when people realize this connection that you can relate the amount of food that you ate with the amount of uh, risk that you have, that created the revolution of this idea of inverting the rationale. And instead of trying to understand what is, why the animals are eating or why they are doing this specific energy over time, we can measure energy over time and figure out how much fear or how much perceived predation risk the animals have in each location. 
So that created a sub-discipline that was called the ecology of fear. And it is quite a powerful method if you think about to even grasp what is inside of the mind of the animal just by measuring how much food he's left. And of course, it's a little bit of a hassle to measure energy over time, right? If you have to have a, uh, a camera and, uh, or something to watch the animal. So we can simplify this even further assume that the metabolic cost and the missing opportunity cost doesn't change in the environment as often as predation risk. So we can cut it out, assume constant. And we, because of diminishing returns, we also know that the harvest rate decreases, the more food is being consumed. And so the less food is left, the higher, the lower is the predation cost, right? So after doing all those 500 simplifications, we can actually do experiments with it. And this is one of the experiments I did, for example, while we were trying to measure how those gerbils here on the corner, how they react to uh, predation risk and how they perceive the, the predation risk. And we manipulated two things in this, in this vivarium that they have in the Bengal University, right? So it's a closed area in which we can let the animals uh, roam free relatively. And in that area, we set up patches with three grams of millet seeds, mix it into these three liters of sand. So you have a diminishing return as a consequence of that. And we saw that the animals were foraging way more below those quote unquote bushes here that are just, you know, protection against a, an area of predator than in the open, right? And more importantly, we also saw that if we remove animals, we removed also the safety from the location. The other animals that remained actually increased, decreased their foraging because they were feeling more afraid, even though there's technically less competition, right? So we coined this idea that there's a risk pump that when an animal moves, he also carries within a safety, like almost like it, it's a fluid. So of course you can always do even cooler things. And one of the things that became super fashionable in the area is the landscape of fear, right? So since we can measure the, the predation risk or the perceived predation risk in different locations, you can make a regular grid and then you can interpolate on each location what is the likelihood of, uh, of, of or how much the animal is feeling afraid relative to the other areas, right? Of course, in this, I'm, I'm cheating a little bit because here in this example, the actual authors measure the, the number of deer killed and interpolated the actual number of deer killed, but you can do the same thing with the giving up densities with the trees I've been talking before. So, and this became quite a boom. But if you find yourself lacking wolves and deers or gerbils, you can also contribute theoretically by basically changing this energy, this fitness function, this energy over time function into more complicated functions and see what that predicts, what that changes it. I did that in one of my papers. I was trying to explain this pattern here that was found by a, a researcher, Jana Eckerd in Potsdam University. She found that if you place a predator that cannot be detected, so the, the risk is uniform, right? the animals have a tendency to aggregate into random patches for reasons that didn't fit the original theory. So I developed a new fitness function with two different sorts of predators, one heterogeneous, one homogeneous, with a specific type of pred predation risk function in relation to time, and use the same trick with derivatives and the Lagrange multipliers to add a constraint about time, and then you get a equation that predicts how these two type of predators actually have opposite effects on the harvest rate, right? I'm jumping through a lot of details here, but it's just to give you guys a notion that you can expand the theory also and use more complicated functions. But there is a big problem with the marginal value theorem that became very obvious from the beginning. On the marginal value theorem, we're assuming that we have this one animal in the in the example that I gave with Sharnov, it was one jaguar, but in the real, in my real data, it was my one gerbil, right? And he's making the decisions alone and all the rest of the environment is static. 
you know, the predation risk is exactly that, the amount of food is exactly that, but life isn't quite that way, right? The same way that the gerbil is reacting to the owl, the owl is reacting to the gerbil. So a simple maximization system doesn't quite answer that. We, should, we need to use more advanced uh, mathematical technique, which is the games from game theory. And one of the first games that people used to investigate, also because it generates some very nice uh, conclusions, is the ideal free distribution. So to give you guys a very quick introduction, the ideal free distribution is a situation in which you can imagine there are two patches of food, one has more food than the others. And then you introduce a rat into this environment and you ask him where he should go, right? Naturally, the, the answer is obvious. It should be the place that there's more food, but we can keep this game going, right? And keep adding more rats. Naturally, they will continue going to the place that is richer until it reaches a certain point in which it makes more sense to go to the patch that has less food, but has less people also to compete for the food, right? And this continues until we reach an equilibrium distribution, right? But this equilibrium distribution is not something static. If one animal, you know, has a fluke and decides to change patch, everybody else is going to recalculate their priorities and they're going to change accordingly, right? That's why this model is, is called ideal and free. The animals are ideal in the sense that they can figure out everything what's going on and calculate what is best for them. And it's free because they just can teleport to the other patch <laughs> and get the food like that. So since we have all this dynamism going on, you can't actually use a simple maximization issue. The, the correct approach, at least, would be an evolutionary finding the evolutionary stable strategy of the system. But unfortunately, I don't think I have time to explain the evolutionary stable strategy, but I can give you guys a very quick short cut that uh, works 80% of the time, which is good enough. So we can just set the fitness or the benefit that you get from each patch equal to one another. And then the animals don't have a stimulus to change their, their current situation. And if we assume that this fitness is just simply the amount of food divided by the amount of animals around, you get this very simple equation that you can then do the simplest uh, algebraic change and you get what's called the Parker's matching rule, right? And the Parker's matching rule, let me just take the, I know I can take that one out. There is a, a, a block in front of the formula. But it's the simple idea that the ratio, the ratio of consumers should be proportional to the ratio of resources. So if you have a pack with the double amount of peanuts, you should have the double amount of rats on it. Very simple. And of course, when people see a simple model, the, the first instinct is to complicate it. So naturally, somebody else came and decided, OK, how does the game change if I had a predator that eats the rat? And not satisfied with that, Rosenheim came and said, okay, what if I add a predator of a predator that eats the rat and the, the gerbil and the, the peanuts? And, you know, of course, there are other ways to complicate it. People add different rats with different uh, unequal competition, uh, competitor ability, and also, you know, resources that vary through time. So there is like hundreds of papers just complicating the idea of distribution. And I couldn't lose the opportunity to do one myself. So I did the generalized data of distribution, which was my attempt to end this game of keeping adding predators. And I created one model that works no matter how many species you have in the community. It doesn't matter if they are competitors, predators, mutualists, all the combinations that exist in uh, ecology. And I did so by incorporating a community matrix, which is just a representation of how much the species on the column of the matrix uh, increases or decreases the fitness of the, of the species on the row of the matrix. So it's a symmetric matrix, species by species. And a feature matrix that represents, you know, stuff that can be found in the patches that are not uh, species, that are not players on that game, right? And jumping very quickly to the conclusion with a little bit of linear algebra, you get to this. And basically it's just, a way to get the matrix that represents the distribution of species per patches, given the community matrix, which is species by species, the how much is each species, like each feature in the landscape, and how those features are distributed among patches. So if some matrix multiplications, you get to a distribution of the animals. So, oops.
I spoiled myself. <laughs> but <laughs> the thing is, quantum theory does seem to give us a lot, right? With that, with the marginal value theorem, we can tell when an animal should leave the patch. And with the ideal fit distribution, we can tell how exactly the animal should distribute themselves, right? No matter what animals you have. Sound like very powerful tools from an ecological perspective. Everything with some evolutionary background in case of the ideal fit distribution, we have the evolutionary stable strategy. And on the case of the marginal value theorems, we have the simple idea that, you know, more energy, more babies. And all of that generating some very simple formulas and principles that can be tested in the field. So very nice, very good, but there is this big problem of finding out if that's true, if that's what the animals are actually doing in the environment. And that's where things start to go downhill pretty quick. Like, as you can see by this brilliantly named paper, right? <laughs> Not a lot of people are convinced by this idea of foraging theory. Some of them by the philosophical side of it, of assuming that, you know, you can simplify the entire evolution mechanism to make more energy, make more babies. But there is also a, an issue with the actual test of those predictions, right? This here on the left is a, a meta-analysis that was basically collecting information of how often the marginal value theorem predictions were right. And they were right some of the times. The problem is that about 50% of the time they were also wrong, right? So, and there was a big divergence of, of a of uh, different scientists among what is right and what is wrong. Because in some cases, if you did some ad hoc adjustment on the, on the predictions, right? Uh, in an example, for example, from Sharnov himself, if you just added a little, uh, an extra term of traveling cost to the growth function uh, in the marginal value theorem, the, his results of the experiment would perfectly fit the data. But you had to do this adjustment, right? So a lot of people saw that, that semi-support slash support with adjustment and said, well, this theory is complete garbage. Let's throw it out. It's not working. And some said like, no, no, the theory is garbage, but you know, it's on the right direction, right? It's at least right half of the time. So we have hope. But I think in my perception of the, of the ecological community, I think the pessimistics are much bigger group of uh, people, but I consider myself more on the side of the optimists. I still have a belief that there is some truth in that theory, even if it's by the fact that it's the best theory that we have at the moment. But then that got me thinking like, okay, how can we fix that? How can we make this theory more accurate, better at representing the real data? And one of the thoughts that I had is that, well, people have been doing a lot of controlled experiments, right? Like the examples that I gave, like the experiment that I did, for example, was in a vivarium. It might not sound very controlled, but for ecological standards, that's way more controlled than what's usually done. Like it's usually we just observe data on nature. So, and the experiments of Charnot, for example, were even more controlled. They were trying to do in a room, controlling exactly how much energy the animal is uh, consuming by you know, flapping his wings and stuff like that. But maybe our mistake is doing that, is trying to control for this noise instead of just accepting the fact that ecology is noisy, right? And perhaps we should try to see the signal through the noise by going the other way, by just accumulating large volumes of data and then trying to see the pattern through it. And that immediately brings the question, what areas of ecology have lots of volumes of data? And until recently, none. But nowadays, we have two big ones that seem to be growing in proportion. The first one of them is occurrence data, or that's mostly used in species distribution modeling. And now we have this big database, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, that collected 2 billion locations of animals all around the world of different species in uh, a huge tempo of slice. So we have now, thanks to the effort of those guys, a lot of a lot of information of where we can find different species, right? So occurrence data is just that, right? Is a I saw an animal in that location at that time. And with that, and with bioclimatic data, 
which you know anything that you can imagine that can influence an animal like pluviosity temperature humidity presence of humans the amount of canopy cover land use you can combine those two sources of data put into a machine learning classificator right usually what people do a lot is to put in several machine learning classificators take an average of everybody the model ensemble and then with that you can generate a probability of occurrence right but this probability of occurrence is not absolute because we never, almost never have information of where the animal isn't, right? Because as it turns out, it's very difficult to confidently be sure that there is no animals inside the specific area. So instead of that, people use pseudo absences, right? Which is just, you know, data in which we haven't spot, spotted an animal. Might, there, might be, there might be one there, there might not, we don't know. So then we generate this relative map of the probability of finding an animal. And if you think about it, it has, in my view, a lot of connection with what we were describing foraging theory, because our foraging maps of, of fear are basically maps of how often, how long the animal foraged there. So how long the animal was in that location. And that map is just a map of how, how likely you are to find that element in that location. Those things seem mathematically related, right? So it feels that there must be some form of connected these two ideas. And just to give an example of what comes out of those pieces, the Busha modeling, I did a study with this friend of mine, Everton, and he had this bunch of data on the location of heart eagles, which is like the biggest eagle in the world or something like that. And the idea is that we're trying to figure out if the Amazon is still one big patch for these animals, like if it's uninterrupted or if it's already being cut by areas that are uh, poor habitats for it, that are, that are cut by areas that have low probability of occurrence. So I did exactly like I mentioned. On the example, I collected a bunch of variables that seemingly should affect an ego, like temperature, pluviosity, human presence, vegetation index, so on and so forth, and then fed it in, in a bunch of uh, machine learning techniques, some, one of them was just logistic regression, so not very machine learning, but you know, there are some cool stuff like Maxent, random forest support vector machines. I even tried an artificial neural network, but it wasn't that successful, so I dropped it out. So, and then you get something like that, right? This is a map that the greener it is, the more likely you, you are relatively to find this, um, the RP, right? And you can, of course, make this prediction binary by finding the optimal cutting point based on a subset of the data that you separate and figure out how can you best divide these, pro these continuous probabilities into presences and absences. And if you do that, you end up with like this contour here that you can see that is slightly blacker, right? That represents the limits of the areas that are positive, that are presences according to the model. And as you can see, the Amazon is still one big mega patch of, uh, of good areas for the animal. And the important part is that those models not only generate some nice maps, but they also have a very good accuracy. They, they range sometimes between uh, 80 to 90% accuracy. So they are quite powerful. And they seem to work even in smaller scales, like this is uh, done by one of the students that I, that I co-advised while I was in my first postdoc. And she did basically the same thing, but instead of modeling the presence of capybaras based on the occurrence of capybaras, we modeled the presence of dead capybaras, right? And we were trying to figure out within the city of Campo Grande, which is just a city with 800,000 people, where is the locations in which you can find the highest amount of accidents and where we can predict that accidents will occur even if we don't have data. Right, and then hopefully we can also uh, figure out ways to stop that from happening. And the results were quite uh, normal in the sense that you know this is an animal that depends on water, so where there is a road next to the water, usually we have a lot of accidents. But of course, beyond occurrence data, we also have movement data. Right, movement data is just you know we put a GPS collar on the animal, so we know exactly where he's going, and it naturally works as occurrence data, right? We know where the animal has been and hence we know that the animal is there. So we can use exactly the same technique 
that we used in occurrence data in species distribution modeling, right? That's one of the things I did with Ronaldo and Sandra. And basically we had some data of 13 pumas. So this guy over here, the middle one, and we knew how they were walking through the uh, state of Sao Paulo and we're trying to figure out within this being shaped blue area, what are the best places to place reserves? And we would make the decision based on where is the places that are relatively more likely to find these uh, pumas. And then we, I did it through two different ways. One method that was more informed by movement data, the conditional logistic regression, and the other more machine learning, more similar to species distribution modeling and uh, the max sense. And as you can see, they have differences among themselves, like one is better than the other accent was slightly more accurate and has a more richness of detail, but they all do the same thing. They generate a, a map of the probability of finding the animal relatively. So movement data can be used like that, but it can also go a step further. It can also help us test the very premises that foraging theory is based, because if you remember from the beginning of the presentation, I assumed that animals walk randomly through the space with movement data can actually test that and very quickly realize that, oops, that no, this is not the case, right? Uh, the very first data that we got for movement ecology already showed us that animals have those things called home ranges, which is just that they tend to hang around a specific location and walk within it, right? And that immediately brings the question, does that, uh, change the probability that they will find patches or that they will find their food or anything, right? In a significant way. And even further, can this explain the theory shortcomings that we're having? Like, can this explain why foraging theory seems to fail half of the time, right? And this is kind of, with that motivation, I, I came to, to, to do the research with Justin Cardos because Justin is exactly trying to propose this, this project to, to try to measure encounter rates better, right? By using more uh, realistic models of animal movements instead of just assuming that they walk in random brown motion. So one of the uh, simplest models that we're considering, for example, is the Ornest Ullenbeck, which is basically a brown motion, but you have a center in the animal hands tends to hang around that center, which is already closer to the idea of home range, right? So, one of the questions that we're having is that if we fit this kind of process to the data and then estimate the encounter rates based on those processes, will it be more accurate than just measuring using uh, metrics that don't assume anything from the model, from, from the type of movement, right? Do we gain more accuracy, more information if we incorporate those models in our process of estimating encounter rates? And if yes, is this change like substantial enough to be um, meaningful? And if we find that indeed the encounter rates uh, measured by the OU process is much different than the encounter rates measured with without models, then this is even further indication that maybe um, that might be the issue that is bothering foraging ecology. But of course, there's other stuff that, uh, if you guys are interested, could be avenues of collaboration, like some ideas that I have. And of course, given time and everything, like the, the priorities to the first project, of course. But for example, it's very well known that animals move uh, in this weird pattern that they usually move very linearly. And then when they find a source of food, they start hanging around to figure out where if there's more food there, and then after some time they give up, right? It feels to me that those areas in which they hang around is the patch, is the food patch that the theory assumes that exists. So if we use uh, the foraging theory within those areas, probably it might work better than what we did before on the control in the controlled experiments in which we try to create our patches, right? But for us to do that, we first have to figure out when the animal is doing that and when he's not doing the gray line. So there is a certain classification problem there 
to figure out how to separate those two situations. I'm also interested in trying to improve the generalized ideal distribution model. As you guys saw there, it was a bunch of matrices. So it's basically a linear representation and the fitness on that function was also linear. And I think I should find a way, I should find a way to incorporate non-linear fitness because this has been shown to be more realistic, but then it involves a process of linearization that I'm not that familiar with, All right? So it would be a nice uh, game theory combination with linear algebra. Another thing that I'm really excited to, to study is that in autonomous vehicles, especially on military ones, people found out that, uh, an algorithm called target visitation problem in which they try to figure out what is the best route between several targets, but those targets have different priorities. So it's not just a traveling salesman problem. Right, and it feels that this is very similar to what foraging is. You want to visit the richer patches first because you don't want to lose it to a competitor. So I wonder if we can test those problems in uh, those uh, algorithms in animal foraging. And there is still one that is entirely game theoretical, which is this idea of, can we prove that home ranges are actually an evolutionary stable strategy? Are they something positive for the animal, right? Why, why would it evolve, essentially? And of course, I don't just want to take from Casos, right? I can also give, so if anybody has any idea of search theory or game theory, those are two things that, because of those areas of research, I, uh, I know a little bit about. And that's pretty much it. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy. If not, there is a rent forage to distract yourselves.